The Rio Grande, a river of immense importance in a dry land. This lifeline has flowed through the American Southwest as long as recorded time. And it has provided humans, animals, and plants a thriving shelter from the harsh forces of the surrounding desert. Nowhere along its shores is this more apparent than in central New Mexico, in a place called Bosque del Apache. That's where the water is. That's where the lush flora is. That's where animals are. Deer, uh, mountain lions, uh, beaver, everything. Well, what's really amazing here on the Bosque is just the sheer opportunity to see just a wide variety of mammal species. The Bosque represents an almost undiscovered treasure trove of the human past. But this spectacular place is best known for its birds. They gather here each winter in great numbers in the well-watered areas of the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge. There are over 20 different types of ducks. Tens of thousands of snow geese flock here. In all, the Bosque offers refuge to over 370 bird species, from songbirds, to shorebirds. But of all the winged residents here at the Bosque, none is more captivating than the sandhill crane. Each year, they migrate long distances to winter along the banks of New Mexico's Rio Grande and they come in great numbers, 28,000 in a given year. The majority of this Rocky Mountain population stays here. From the outlook on the farm loop, visitors can observe large flocks of sandhills feeding. Migratory bird expert Don Cacamese explains the not so obvious importance of this activity. The cranes here at the Bosque spend most of their time feeding. They'll put on 20 or 25 percent of their body weight through the course of the winter. That's critically important because when they arrive in the breeding grounds in the spring, there'll be very little there for them to eat. The vegetation here in the Bosque provides vital calories and nutrients that'll be required for successful migration and successful reproduction. And there's a good selection of things to eat. The refuge managers allow some of the local farmers to share crops, certain areas on the refuge. And that's a good deal for all involved. Farmers get to use the irrigated land and harvest part of the crop. And the cranes, they get to use what's left behind. That's why you can see such large numbers of cranes and geese here at the Bosque. The sand hills get to feast on alfalfa, on large fields of corn, and on tender aquatic plants. With such an abundance of food, they maintain an adult weight of about nine and a half pounds for the females and up to 12 pounds for the males. Unlike the blue herons here that thrive on fish in the bosky waterways, 
Cranes are mainly vegetarian, but they'll eat just about anything. Frogs and snakes and baby birds, birds' eggs, and a whole variety of plant material. But what they really seem to relish is a plant that grows naturally along the Rio Grande Valley. Come on, let me show you. This is chufa, or yellow nutsedge. But this isn't the part of the plant that the birds like. What they like are these, small chufa nodules that are connected to the plant's roots. These nutritious bits look a lot like grape nuts. This is where the power and versatility of the Sandhills bill comes into use. With forceful drilling into the soil, the bird uses its bill like a garden tool. It probes into the dense valley soil as deep as six inches to get at the chufa nodules. These nutritious nuggets offer important protein and minerals needed by the cranes to support the breeding process later in the year. Sandhills are deft with their bills. In fact, a visitor at the International Crane Foundation had her shining hearing aid plucked away without a scratch to its owner. This amazing dexterity helps the cranes in all kinds of situations in the wild. Spending time with the Bosque Sandhills allows one to witness special rhythms that occur here throughout their day. Some of the cranes begin their morning on the wetland ponds created by refuge staff. By sunrise, the sand hills begin to take off for the feeding fields just to the north. They have built up quite an appetite after an evening spent on the ice. While this is not the most comfortable place to bed down, it affords these birds protection from predators. This wide open area allows cranes to easily see intruders during the night. Even this whooping crane, one of the few on the refuge, joins the sand hills at the roost. It too heads off for a day in the fields. Another group of cranes begin their day on this sandbar in the middle of the Rio Grande. At this hour, they are mostly quiet. Some begin to pick in the mud for the day's first food. Others simply look around and wait. For the next hour or so after first light, the cranes begin to take off in small groups of two or three. It is a slow process, but by eight o'clock only a group of 20 remain. One of the larger cranes appears to be anxious to leave. He squawks at the others as if saying, it's time to go. And later, he begins to flap his wings in encouragement. Several others copy this dance. 
Early settlers dubbed the sand hills preacher birds because this activity to them resembled a preacher leading a congregation. Scientists view this as a courtship ritual or as displacement behavior, one that helps release frustration or pent-up energy. After about 10 minutes, this group appears ready to leave. In one great moment, the flock takes off. The sandbar will be quiet now until their sunset return. After arriving, the sandhills spend most of the daylight hours roaming and eating in the fields. But there are always several cranes within the flock that watch out for predators while others eat. This crane suddenly spots something at the edge of the field. Without an audible warning, the rest of the group stops eating. They watch in unison. This time, it's no cause for concern, however. It's just a Rio Grande wild turkey passing by. Once assured of their safety, the flock returns to feeding. Various other distinctive behaviors can be observed throughout the day. Cranes are social animals and call out constantly, making the feeding fields quite a loud, raucous place. One particular sound is the unison call. It occurs between a paired couple. Sandhill cranes mate for life, and this call is the basis for understanding their social bonding. Biologists believe that the unison call is used for a number of functions, from establishing territory, to a warning call, to a recognition of one's mate. Preening, or feather ruffling, is another daily behavior that scientists believe has a social function beyond the obvious. Some believe that this activity is used in aggressive meetings between two cranes, allowing the threatened crane to watch the aggressor from all angles. Sometimes, of course, this does not deter the attacker like here, and the passive crane is actually run off. Another behavior is the crouch threat. This can be seen here as another bird flies in above the heads of these two cranes. By four o'clock, parts of the flock begin to return to the Rio. Here, one can see the intention pose prior to takeoff. Some cranes extend their head and neck, become more horizontal, and eventually fly out. Sand hills, along with the snow geese, make this a spectacular time of day at Bosque del Apache. With thousands of birds in flight and an impressive New Mexico sunset, 
The sights and sounds overwhelm. It is almost dark by the time all the Rio flock returns to the sandbar. After hours in the dry fields, the cranes take repeated long swills of water to quench their thirst. Soon they will gather in a group for protection during the night. The daily rhythm of the sand hills is complete. The greater sandhill cranes that you see here today are involved in a rhythm of events far larger than the borders of Bosque del Apache. These birds are part of the northern flock, and each year they undertake a trek to the breeding grounds some 800 miles to the north. By late February, small groups of sandhills begin testing the local thermals in preparation for their spring migration. Soon, large groups begin to leave the bosque. Sometimes, thousands of cranes depart in a single day. Usually within a week, the entire flock has exited. With the raucous crowds of cranes and geese gone, the bosque takes on a tranquil silence. This Rocky Mountain flock is the largest single population of greater sandhill cranes in North America. Estimates range from 17,000 to 25,000 birds. Leaving the refuge of the Rio Grande Valley, the cranes fly north, following the spine of the Rockies through Colorado. Then it is on to the breeding grounds in the area where Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho meet. It is here, like in these wetlands at Red Rock Lakes National Wildlife Refuge in Montana, that the greater sand hills choose to breed and raise young. But something has dramatically changed with these cranes since their winter days at the bosque. They are now brown. The culprit? As the cranes clean their feathers, they literally paint themselves with the ferrous minerals found in the water and mud of Red Rock Lakes. If you look close, a gray neck can still be seen, but from where the bill can touch and below, the brown mineral stain persists. As they change location, this color fades away as the birds preen themselves with other water. Set in front of the majestic Centennial Mountains, a single egg is found in a sandhill nest. It is a good five inches long and will soon hatch. Upon approaching this well-hidden nest, both parents fled, but the female, in hopes of luring the intruders away, fakes a broken wing. This is a prime example of sandhill nesting behavior. They staunchly defend their offspring. In fact, the parents are even aggressive to other cranes at this time. It is distinctively different behavior for these usually social, gregarious birds. Sandhill cranes employ a range of strategies to ensure their numbers in the wild. At one end of this range are species that produce a large number of offspring, but invest very little time and energy in the survival of each individual. At the other end of this range are species that produce very few offspring, but invest a great deal in the survival of each individual. Sandhill cranes are in this latter group. Mortality is low because sandhills have secure family bonds that last lifetimes. They are extremely nest attentive and defend their young vigorously. What they sacrifice as a species is energy expended and small numbers of young. Even with these efforts, about 20% of the crane's nests fail. At best, a sandhill pair brings only two juveniles south. Throughout the Montana summer, the young cranes grow at an astonishing rate. Within a day after birth, they begin to walk. And within two to three more, the chicks can swim. In 10 weeks, the young begin flying, and by summer's end, they are close to the size of their parents. 
The rich nesting grounds of Red Rock Lakes have served these sand hills well. By October, the flock is ready for their return journey to New Mexico's Rio Grande Valley. While migrating, cranes can travel over 30 miles per hour. Many times they take advantage of thermals and strong tailwinds. Often they just glide with the river of air. They travel six to seven hours a day. But the 800 mile journey is not completed in consecutive days. Often the cranes stop over in Colorado and feed for a while. Weather, of course, is always a delaying factor. Sand hills like clear, bright days or moonlit evenings to fly. The entire migration from Idaho to New Mexico will take close to a month. This spectacular footage was taken by Kent Clegg, an Idaho farmer who has a great love of cranes and a desire to see the endangered whooping cranes established as part of the Sandhill Rocky Mountain flock. Whoopers, only a few hundred exist today, have a different migratory route than the Rocky Mountain Sandhill flock. Normally, they summer at Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada and winter along the Texas Gulf Coast or in near Aransas. Kent and others believe that by establishing an alternate migration route, the species will be ensured of a backup population in case the main population of whooping cranes meet an unexpected environmental or natural disaster. To achieve this goal, Kent has imprinted himself on a group of first-year sandhills and four whoopers. They recognize him as their parent and follow his lead when it comes to the fall migration flight. He hopes that the flock, by following his ultralight aircraft to Bosque del Apache, will establish this route as their annual migratory truck. But even with Kent nearby, the journey is not without hazards. Here, one of the whoopers is suddenly attacked mid-air by a golden eagle. After plunging to the ground, the young crane was recovered with only minor injuries. It was later transported to the bosque, where it rejoined the rest of the group. The average lifespan of sand hills ranges from 15 to 20 years, although some individual birds have been known to live for more than 30 years. One thing is for sure, this ancient flyway over the western part of North America has existed for millennia. Scientists claim that cranes have existed since the time of the dinosaurs. And these sandhills continue their species' time-honored habit of migration. As humans continue to populate and urbanize the Rio Grande Valley, the role of the bosque as a refuge takes on a great significance for the sandhill cranes. By the time the cranes reach here, it is already late October or November. The importance of this ancient flyway can't be overstated. Perhaps Eldo Leopold captured best the wonder of the crane migration when he said, they live and have their being, these cranes, not in the constricted present, but in the wider reaches of evolutionary time. Their annual return is the ticking of a geological clock. Upon the place of their return, they confer a particular distinction a paleontological patent of nobility, one in the march of eons. As the cranes return, so do many others to feast on the rich feeding fields. However, the birds of the bosque are not alone in the quest for food. One of the most resourceful animals in New Mexico also inhabits these wetlands, sometimes at the expense of the cranes. Dr. John Boren explains. I've seen coyotes in about every habitat type in the Southwest, from mountain meadows all the way down to desert grasslands. But here on the Bosque, particularly during the winter, you'll have the opportunity to see some of the most well-fed coyotes in the state of New Mexico. In fact, some people truly believe that there are more coyotes here at the Bosque per unit area than anywhere else in the state. This is not only due to the abundance of wild game, but also due to the fact that coyotes are protected from hunters within their refuge borders. This resilient mammal is constantly on the lookout for birds that don't survive the freeze of night or like the sandhill crane which died from sickness. 
coyote has the same hunting abilities as its other canine relatives, the wolf and fox. Sharp eyesight, excellent hearing, and exceptional sense of smell. Refuge managers here believe that the coyote plays a unique role in helping these birds survive the long winter. You'll notice behind me birds feeding on corn that has been knocked down by bosky workers. However, they tend to stay out of the taller corn because they simply can't see well enough through the taller stalks. I've actually seen this happen. The sandhills will stand for long periods of time right on the edge of an open area, deliberating if they should enter the cornfield. Usually they pass on this idea, wary of the possibility of a coyote laying in the way. They then just stick to the food in the open fields. When the birds have finished, the refuge tractors return to knock down additional roads. In this way, the year's corn isn't eaten all at once, but is deliberately made available a portion at a time so that the flocks will have enough food until they begin their spring migration. Mike Olden from the refuge believes that the coyotes do help the cranes in several ways. Uh, one thing they do is they keep the birds moving from crop to crop to crop, and they don't let them devastate uh, their foraging areas. And uh, the coyote also picks up diseased birds, uh, birds that would otherwise stay in the flock and maybe uh, litter the wetlands uh, you know, with their remains. Coyotes are right there to pick them up. The coyote plays an effective management role by conserving the corn supply so that there's enough for the birds to eat throughout the entire winter. Although this hadn't been proven scientifically yet, it does provide for a unique theory in wildlife management here on the Bosque. The coyote hasn't been much help to the mule deer populations, however. In recent years, refuge herds have declined sharply due to disease and coyote predation among fawns. Uh, in the early 80s, probably uh, the biggest thing was the scabies mite outbreak that uh, got in the population. Of course, the increase uh, overcrowding and uh, all these deer uh, being social together, uh, the mite was pretty well spread uh, easy through the population. It left the deer vulnerable to uh, predation, and so that uh, uh, was probably what cut down the population the biggest. One thing we know about uh, predators, and specifically speaking, the coyote, is that they do take a fair amount of deer. They take about 50% of the fawn crop that is uh, uh, dropped in the summer. The deer that have survived are often done to be found in areas like this. I really think this place lives up to its name, a refuge with an excellent source of cottonwoods, willows, and shrubs that do provide the mule deer with an excellent source of shelter and also a bountiful food supply. These mammals are primarily browsers and can be seen often in small groups around the bosque. In the early morning hours, they graze much like here, eating green alfalfa left behind by farmers who use the refuge. They also eat naturally occurring grasses and buds from trees and shrubs. The mule deer gets its name from its unusually long ears. The males have long, graceful antlers that differ from those like the whitetail. If you look closely, you'll see that they are forked rather than having points rising from the main beam of the antlers as on whitetails. Another mammal that seeks shelter in the refuge's vegetation is the porcupine. With a little bit of patience and time, you'll have the opportunity to spot one like this in the top of a cottonwood tree. Being North America's second largest rodent, only the beaver is bigger, the porcupine puts its teeth to work, eating the soft bark of river trees in this valley. Refuge managers have told me that their feasting does not really hurt the trees. Their numbers are low enough and the individuals travel from tree to tree, reducing the impact on any single plant. The porcupine is probably best known for its quills, its natural defensive armor that really makes up for its slow movement. If you take a look here, these rigid spines make a formidable deterrence for an aggressive predator. They are loosely attached to the porcupine so that they can easily penetrate and remain with an attacker. These quills are not shot out of the porcupine like some people believe. Rather, the animal thrashes its tail from side to side vigorously in hopes of warding off a menacing predator. 
These animals usually weigh between 9 and 13 pounds, although the record is a whopping 37 pounds. None have been seen that large at the Bosque. They tend to lead solitary life along the Rio here, but they have also been seen in the desert and grasslands surrounding the refuge. Coyotes, porcupines, and mule deer are not the only mammals that you'll find here on the Bosque. With a little bit of patience and a keen eye, you'll have the opportunity to spot elk, beaver, bobcats, and even an occasional mountain lion wandering in from the surrounding Chihuahua Desert. These mammals, along with others, do make up for the diverse fauna that you'll experience here on the Bosque. While mammals are attracted to the lush environment of the refuge, so too are the hunters of the sky. They are the raptors, or birds of prey, those aerial masters that rely on the abundant food supply that the bosque supplies. The most spectacular of these hunters that resides here is the American bald eagle. This threatened species inhabits the refuge from December through March and can often be seen perched above the wetlands looking for prey. Eagles, like this immature bald, usually eat fish, but in the wintertime, these birds tend to eat a variety of things. In this season of shorter days, colder temperatures, and a relatively scarce food supply, the eagles come here. The bosque supports waterfowl by the thousands, during cold spells, when Rio and pond water freeze, it is almost a daily occurrence that a few of the huge flock's weaker members don't survive the night. The bald eagles scavenge the birds that die. Here, an immature bald feasts on a bird. But not for long. This mature eagle chases the younger bird away. The dead bird now belongs to him. Evidence of the kill is frequent in the fields of the bosque. But the eagles also use their predatory skills. Often when a group of snow geese are disrupted during the day, it is the work of a bald eagle rousting up the flock. But most of their time is spent watching for an easy opportunity. A dead bird on the road. A slower, weaker member of the flock. There are quite a few immature members in this year's group. Of the 25 bald eagles here this winter, 20 are immature. Their coloring ranges from white and brown speckled to almost black. It takes them years to get the distinctive white crown of their elders. Immatures change gradually over each summer. They eventually lose their brown spotty look, but this doesn't occur until after their first four to five years. Immature balds here can be seen quite close to the visitor's tour loop. They like this bare tree that was put here by Bosque staff. The adults also go for this perch. For 360 degrees, the eagles can scan the horizon over this wide pond. It serves as an ideal lookout. It also serves as a resting place for this adult to finish a meal. But the bald eagles do not have a monopoly on this tree. This crow likes to perch here too. Soon he is joined by several other crows who hope to pick up some drop scraps. But the eagle lets his objections be heard. Finally, the crows get the hint and fly away. The mature bald, while still seeming a bit irritated, is finally left alone. 
far more serious disturbances can be caused by humans. And for these birds, that can be problematic during the winter. In the days of limited sunlight and cold temperatures, eagles waste valuable hunting time and energy flying away from people. Those balds who prefer a more secluded roost can always choose to stay in the limited access sections of the refuge that receive few visitors. Bald eagles are but one species of raptor found here. Several types of hawks also cruise the Bosque Flyway, like this northern harrier. With amazing dexterity and use of the wind, this bird is constantly screening the grasses for small rodents. The Swainson's hawk is also found here. But none is more frequently seen than the red-tailed hawk. They perch among the same dead trees as the bald eagles in search of prey. On this small island in the middle of a pond, a snow goose failed to survive the night. Just after first light, a red tail inspects the fallen bird and then eventually leaves. Ten minutes later, a northern harrier hawk flies overhead to inspect the goose. As the day gets brighter, the red tail quickly returns to claim its prize. Finally, he begins to feed. Over the next two hours, the hawk devours the snow goose. Mallard ducks casually drift by, seemingly unaffected by what is happening on the island. Finally, with most of the snow goose gone, the red tail takes off to finish his meal on a nearby perch. The bounty of the bosque has again provided for the hunters of the sky. Only feathers and a bit of carcass remain of the snow goose. Nighttime hunters of the refuge include several families of great horned owls. This one resides in a cottonwood tree in the bottom of the valley. This nest is also located in a cottonwood, but an isolated one in the surrounding desert brushland. This parent chooses to raise its young in the shelter of these cliffs at the southern boundary. American kestrels are the smallest of the raptors here. In fact, they are the smallest of all falcons. Their sleek bodies and alert instincts help them feed on the smaller rodents, insects, and reptiles of the refuge. These streamlined, powerful hunters of the sky were formerly called sparrow hawks. Just like their animal relatives, it is quite logical why humans, over the ages, have been drawn to the shelter of the bosque. With abundant water, plants, and food, this habitat has always been full of life compared to the relatively sparse desert surroundings. The Spanish named this place Bosque del Apache, which means Woods of the Apache, for nomadic Mescalero Apaches often visited here. But long before their arrival, there existed another group, one that made this resting place on an ancient flyway their home. The people who lived along the river in this part of New Mexico are known as the Piro. The Piro populations who inhabited this area of the Bosque located here because at that period 
in their history, uh, this region offered the ideal circumstances and climate for the kind of agricultural lifestyle that they depended on. Uh, it was, was lush with game. There was plenty of water. The frost-free season during the year was long enough to successfully produce good crops of corn, beans, and squash. In rocky areas surrounding the bosque exists a rich visual record of the Piro. Petroglyphs, symbols diligently etched into rock with hand tools, tell much of what the environment was like here centuries ago. We see that certain animals are uh, emphasized more than others. These people seemed particularly concerned with deer, uh, mountain sheep, uh, various species of fish, as well as the birds. We see a lot of birds in the rock art, including some of the more famous ones that draw so many visitors to this region every winter. This ancient image outlines a long-necked bird with a strong likeness to a sandhill crane. This piece possibly mimics a goose while in flight. And this form has the distinctive shape of the mythical thunderbird. Many of the petroglyphs around the bosque seem to take on a spiritual quality and speculation of what these symbols represented is limited only by one's imagination. However, it is perhaps better to look at this aged rock art from a historical rather than an emotional perspective. Probably the biggest problem in understanding rock art is the fact that it represents the uh, symbolic uh, conceptions of people who are long gone. Native peoples didn't make the kinds of distinctions between the sacred and the profane that modern uh, industrial populations make today. All of the birds and animals uh, and natural places on the landscape were uh, both sacred and of everyday significance. There's really no way to effectively read it. While the rock art sites in and around the refuge serve as the most visible reminders of the Piro past, one of the most significant finds is here. To the untrained eye, this place along the eastern edge of the Rio looks quite unremarkable. But if you look closer, small remains of Piro greatness remain. Shards of highly decorated pots. A well-worn tool used for straightening the shafts of arrows and finely chipped points used for hunting local game. Underneath this ground lies one of the largest Piro settlements of the past. It is called Qualacu. In the 1980s, archaeologists opened part of this ancient Piro town and were impressed by the size and structure. Estimates are that over 1,200 people could have lived at Qualacu but records from an early Spanish expedition give an even more vivid picture of what life was like for these Bosque residents. Their houses are of mud, built by hand. The walls like a small adobe is a half yard wide. They contain upper and lower floors and have bedrooms. The people climb to the upper floors by means of movable hand ladders, and the lower part of the pueblo can be dominated from above. In each pueblo, in the center of the plazas, are some very large cellars, two and a half estados deep, with an entrance in the shape of a trap door and with a step ladder. They are all whitewashed and provided with stone benches all around. Here, the people perform their games and dances. Luxon's account of the Espejo Expedition, 1583. But by the end of the 1600s, most of the Piro culture had disappeared. Disease from the newly landed Europeans killed many. Others moved to the northern pueblos. 
Later, some joined the Spanish in their retreat from the Pueblo Revolt. In any event, the effects were dramatic. Within 100 years of their first Spanish encounters, the Piro, as a unified culture, ceased to exist. Humans have changed the bosque in many ways since the Pueblo's disappearance. Spanish settlers also tapped the Rio for agricultural water, developing a sophisticated system of acequias, or irrigation canals. Later, gigantic dams were also built along the Rio to ensure constant water supply throughout the growing season and to eliminate flooding from the spring runoff or summer monsoon rains. River communities expanded into the previously vulnerable Rio Grande floodplain. And eventually, plants were introduced that were not native to this ancient bosque. This one, tamarisk, or salt cedar, was introduced here in the 1940s to help control erosion. Since then, it has become the dominant vegetation, causing a number of problems. Dr. Kurt McDaniel explains. There's nothing wrong with a monoculture of salt cedar if you had a little bit of it. But when you have virtually nothing but salt cedar over a large area, then you've created a situation where you've got a habitat that's only desirable to a very limited number of, of uh, species. And for a wildlife refuge, that's not very de desirable. Since the late 80s, McDaniel has worked with refuge biologist John Taylor on reducing salt cedar at the bosque. They used a combination of mechanical removal, carefully applied herbicides, and fire to get rid of this invading plant. Here, the remaining dead salt cedar provide an environment for a popular rookery, a place where birds gather to nest and bring up their young. Today, great egrets and cormorants flock to this area, where just last year, the impenetrable tamarisk groves prohibited nesting. But in other areas where salt cedar had been removed, only open fields of dirt remain. If other vegetation was not established, the salt cedar would quickly return. The perplexing question was, what to put in its place? Taylor and McDaniel decided to mimic the historic cyclic flooding of the Rio, which occurred here before the dams, and to reintroduce native plants like cottonwood and willow. We've con controlled salt cedar on an area. Uh, the area, is, it's kind of left much as if uh, the river had just come through with a severe flood and created a, or scoured and created a, uh, you know, a mud flat. We'll develop uh, water management capabilities all around. We'll build dikes around. We'll uh, divert uh, irrigation water into an area, flood it up to peak uh, levels. And uh, during that period, late May, early June, we'll begin dropping our water levels and creating that mud flat. Every year in late May, early June, cottonwood and willow release thousands and thousands of early born seeds. It's timed ecologically to coincide with those uh, flood events. It's just like a blizzard in some days. So the seed uh, lands on that moist substrate. It germinates uh, generally within about 24 hours and you get a seedling. There is no longer that natural function anymore. So it's, it's incumbent on us to recreate that, to reproduce that, or else we'll uh, continue to see uh, salt cedar dominate an area of vegetation change. Today, Taylor and McDaniel can walk through large areas of cottonwood and other native plants, much like the Piro did centuries ago. While many visitors concentrate on the riverside area of the bosque, it comprises only 5% of the total land area of the refuge. Flanked on both sides of the Rio are square miles of Chihuahuan desert foothills and grasslands. 
And while the comeback of native plants in the wetlands is quite a remarkable story, the desert also has its share of botanical marvels. Dr. Kelly Allred explains. Most people think of the Bosque del Apache in terms of a place like this, a rather typical riparian habitat with cottonwoods and cattails. And indeed, this is what most visitors see. These areas look this way due to the abundance of water supplied by the river and also from the thick, dense soil found in this area. Layers of rich sediment brought down this valley over the millennia. Today, however, we're going to travel away from the river to areas on the refuge where few people go and see how differences in soil and water change the kinds of plants that grow in a particular spot. Right here, we're standing next to the definitive edge of the wetlands. Just behind us is the Rio Grande. However, in the matter of a few short steps, you can see we make an immediate change from a Rio environment to a desert environment with absolutely no transition zone in between. Along this dividing line, you can see an abrupt change of plants. Here we find sand sage, broom dahlia, and giant drop seed, each one adapted to living in the shifting sands of this dune environment. One big difference here is water. We're only a few feet higher than the river, but far enough that the water table is well below us. The other difference is soil. Rather than the heavy clay soil of the river bottom, what we have here is loose sand. In this dune area, water percolates rapidly through these soil particles, leaving a dry soil surface. Let's take a walk now and travel the Chupadera Trail, another place on the Bosque where desert plants live in the extreme. This is a typical Chihuahuan Desert brush community. The refuge lies at the northern tip of the Chihuahuan Desert, which occurs mostly in Mexico, plus parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. A dominant shrub of this region is creosote bush. As you can see, it's very well adapted to life in gravelly, well-drained slopes. Its leaves are covered with a varnish that reduces water loss. This is what gives creosote bush its fragrant aroma after a desert rain. I'm standing along a distinct borderline between two plant communities of the Chihuahuan Desert. To the south is the brush community with creosote bush. This is a hotter, drier environment, receiving direct rays from the sun most of the day. By taking just a few steps to the north, we're in a grassland community. Because of its north-facing slope, it's more moist, has more available water, and the grasses are able to grow. What you see here is the desert grass, black grama. This is the typical grass of the desert grasslands, although the soil here is basically the same as on the south slope. Black grama cover here is denser, which reduces evaporation, along with the fact that this north slope receives less direct sunshine. Well, it's time to continue our hike, this time to the canyon trail, and visit yet another plant community on the refuge. We're going to go back in time to a community that was here at the end of the last ice age. Come on, let's go. Here we are at the high point of the Canyon Trail. And what's interesting about this place are these two junipers. Junipers give us a window into the past. Plant communities often shift, slip and slide, change, with changes in environment. During the Ice Age, the climate was much different than it is today. The environment was wetter and cooler, and the plant community was very different. Even down by the river, the dominant uh, community was a woodland, and the chief species was this juniper. As the ice melted, the climate shifted again and became warmer and drier and there was a shift in the plant community. These pinyon trees and the woodland plants with them had to retreat away from the lowlands up into the higher elevations. They were replaced at the lower elevations by the grassland and the desert brush communities that we've just seen. 
the woodland communities retreated back into the hills, back up into the mountains. Today, few junipers exist in this area. And as we've seen, desert shrubs and grasses dominate the vegetation along the river. This arid environment surrounds the bosque. And ever since the Ice Age, this green strip in the desert has been a welcome destination on a very ancient flyway. Back in the valley, spring has returned to the bosque wetlands. And with it, the relentless spring winds. Many different birds travel ancient migratory routes and use the bosque as a resting stop along their journey. But what is most striking is the large number of water birds that come here, like this flock of white pelicans, species that you would normally expect to see along America's coastlines or inland lakes, certainly not in the middle of the New Mexico desert. These shore birds and water birds are well adapted for feeding along the wetland banks and the bosque attracts a number of different species. There are American avocets, and white-faced ibis with brilliant iridescent plumage. Snowy egrets also search for food here, stirring up the wetland bottom with their feet. Another water bird that hunts the bosque waters is the belted kingfisher. Long-billed dowitchers also stop to feed here. They are the migration marathoners, wintering in Mexico and breeding in the Arctic tundra. The larger wading birds of the bosque include the great egret. And the great blue heron. Another heron species is the black crowned night heron. These noisy nocturnal herons tend to favor this western edge of the refuge, where thick foliage allows them to conceal their nests. With great flocks of sandpipers gracing the skies, springtime marks the very special season of shore and water birds. Their syncopated aerial acrobatics are, indeed, a wonder to watch. And as the spring birds signal the beginning of yet another year, one can't help but ponder the past importance of this ancient site. Bosque del Apache is a special place in a dry land, an oasis on the fringe of the arid Chihuahuan Desert. It has nurtured humans for centuries, allowing them to build great civilizations as evidenced by inspired Piro ruins. And for millennia, it has served as a major intersect along the ancient flyway of the Rio Grande. But perhaps its role as a refuge is even more relevant today. This remarkable place is of utmost importance for many of the region's animals. As human population increases in the river valley, the role of the refuge in preserving a nourishing environment becomes even more critical. 
It is in our best interest to continue this preservation for ourselves and our Earth, to which we are inescapably linked.